Hi everyone, this is Chris Ng here, and this is a video adjunct just talking about missed pills as well as the extended use of combined hormonal contraceptives. Again, this is a deep dive into sort of my, one of my favorite topics, contraception, and just for the record, this is not testable in your exam, so don't stress about it. So I've got a couple questions for you guys. The first question is, what is the efficacy and effectiveness of an oral combined hormonal contraceptive? And what is the difference between efficacy and effectiveness? So this is from the SOGC guideline from 2015, just talking about uh, contraception. And this is one of my favorite tables, and I show this a lot to patients. It goes through sort of a series of different forms of contraception. And it goes through sort of what is the chance of someone experiencing a pregnancy within the first year of perfect use? And what is the percentage of people in real life with typical use? And that's really important to stratify the differences. And this is why we always focus so much on the use of reliable contraception. When we take a look at combined hormonal contraceptives, in theory, with perfect use, which is efficacy. So efficacy is a fancy word, so it means sort of in, in a laboratory setting or a study setting, only three women per thousand will actually get pregnant with a birth control pill. However, in real life, almost 9% of people in the first year will get pregnant. And this is really important to acknowledge because every time we recommend a birth control pill as a first line choice, one in 10 patients that we recommend it to will get pregnant unintendedly that year. So this really leads to sort of, of why we recommend higher tiers of effectiveness. And this includes things like intrauterine devices, as well as implants. So if you take a look at the effectiveness of IUDs, you can see effectiveness, we see failure rates well less than 1%. So that is why they are tier one uh, contraceptives. Question number two, which is the worst week to miss a birth control pill? And the second question of this is gonna be, which is the best week? So is it week one, week two, week three, or week four? Okay, place your bets now. And the answer is going to be week one. And let's talk about why that is. So this is a, a handout I actually give to patients quite a bit. This is actually a algorithm for missed uh, combined oral contraceptives from the SOGC guideline from 2017. And let's, let's run through it a little bit. So the first thing to know is that you can actually miss a pill for almost 24 hours and it doesn't actually make too much of a difference. That's the benefit of having the combined both estrogen and progesterone is it gives a little bit more leeway. So if you end up missing a pill for less than 24 hours, you just take your pill right away and just keep on taking your next pill daily as you normally would. Now here's where it gets interesting. So what if you miss more than one active pill for more than 24 hours? And this is where it gets stratified into the different weeks. So I'm just going to take a look at the bottom part of that algorithm. So during week one, even if you just miss one pill for more than 24 hours, you should immediately use backup contraception and consider emergency contraception. That's pretty scary. If you just miss one pill, you're at risk of having an unplanned pregnancy. On the flip side, if you take a look at weeks two or three, you could actually miss up to three pills and I wouldn't even care. You wouldn't need to take emergency contraception in this case. What we would do in that case is basically we would basically finish that pack off and skip the hormone-free interval and start your next pack. And, you're, and we'll talk about why that is in a little bit. In fact, it's not until you miss three or more pills during week two or three do you have to use backup contraception and emergency contraceptives. So that's a huge difference between weeks two and three compared to week one. And the question is why? So this is goes to, so harkens back to sort of first year. And this is one of my favorite graphs, just talking about the menstrual cycle and also just talking about what happens to the various hormones that are there and what happens to the ovaries. So if we flash back, so we look back at the beginning of the menstrual cycle at day zero. What happens is that the follicles start growing in response to follicular stimulating hormone. As the follicles grow, eventually one follicle gets selected as the dominant follicle. And this dominant follicle is now independent of FSH. So, and it starts producing estradiol. So you can see the estradiol levels start rising. And this provides negative feedback and actually suppresses the release of FSH. And what that does is that the following FSH now basically kills off all the other follicles 
and only the dominant follicle, which is independent, continues to grow. And this is really why, for the most part, we only have singleton pregnancies. And that's pretty amazing considering that at birth there's over a million follicles within the ovaries itself. But that is where things get messy because when you miss a pill in the first week, you extend the hormone-free interval and you allow more time for a dominant follicle to be selected. Once a dominant follicle is selected, you're screwed because even taking more birth control pills won't help you and you need to move on to emergency contraception or backup uh, contraceptives. The, if you miss a pill in weeks two or three, it's okay. We treat it like a hormone-free interval. At that point in time, the ovulation has already been suppressed and basically you just treat it like your withdrawal bleed and then you move on to the next pack. So the second part of that question, which is the best week to miss a pill? And this is kind of a trick question. It's really just week four. Week four typically is full of placebo pills that don't contain any hormones. So if you miss one, it's not the end of the world. Question number three. Should combined hormonal contraceptive rings be removed prior to intercourse? And this is a question you're actually going to get quite a bit. Um, number A would be yes, you should remove it before every episode of intercourse. B would be never, never get take it out. You must keep it in there at all times or else you're in trouble. Or C is it can be removed, not, not ideally, but you can remove it up to one hour and then it should be cleaned and reinserted. Or number D, you can actually remove it for up to three hours. And the answer is D. You can actually remove it for up to three hours at a time. Going back to that same 2017 guideline, this is the algorithm for missed uh, rings. And you can see here, you can actually remove it for uh, less than three hours, and it's not a big deal. You just basically put it in right away. During week one, if you remove it for more than three hours, you are, again, you're at risk of selecting a new dominant follicle. You're at risk of an unplanned pregnancy. Therefore, you should be moving on to that emergency contraception and backup contraceptive. And in weeks two to three, you can actually leave it up for up to three days and you still don't have to use emergency contraception. So what a huge difference from three hours in the first week to needing three days at weeks two to three. So it leads to the question, so what has been the biggest innovation in contraception in the last decade? And what's cool now is that traditionally birth control pills have always contained 21 active pills and seven placebo pills. But no birth control pill that comes out nowadays will ever come out with that standard because the new standard that's there is actually a shorter hormone-free interval. So you see packs of 24 active pills and four placebo pills or 26 active pills and two placebo pills. And that makes a huge difference. Why? When we take a look at reviews looking at the advantages of a shorter hormone-free interval, we can actually see quite a big difference. When you, the biggest, the, the majority of side effects that people experience uh, with their, their menstrual cycle as well as with hormonal contraception actually comes in the hormone free interval. And it's actually the change in hormones that triggers often the headaches, the mood changes, and the bloating, the breast tenderness that are associated with combined hormonal contraceptives. So you actually get less PMS symptoms if you have a shorter hormone free interval. In addition, because there's less fluctuations, you actually have less breakthrough bleeding. And finally, there's better ovarian suppression with less unintended pregnancies. In this case, if you have 24 active pills and only four placebo pills, even if you miss one pill in week one, you only have a five-day hormone-free interval. That's not bad. You could arguably miss three pills in a row in the first week of a 24 and four pill, and you would actually just be at your seven-day hormone-free interval. So that's why it's actually more reliable as a contraceptive. And that leads to sort of the final recommendation I have is that whenever I offer a patient a combined hormonal contraceptive is I actually encourage them to take it continuously. Why have a period every single month? I don't have periods, but sh they sure sound pretty terrible. My whole day is spent listening to people complain about their periods. Um, and when we look at this from the national guidelines from 2017, we see that using birth control pills in a continuous or extended manner, so that means typically having a period every three to four months or just not having a period whatsoever, we see that there's benefits. There's less pelvic pain, headaches, bloating, breast tenderness. There's fewer withdrawal bleeds, and there's less unintended pregnancy as well. 
there are some small downsides to this uh, is that you eventually not everybody can get to three to four months of taking a continuous birth control pill often they'll start getting unscheduled bleeding or spotting it takes some time to thin out the lining of the uterus enough that you don't have this this irregular spotting it does also cost a little bit more money it, it costs about three extra packs per year just to make up for those hormone free intervals and this you know packs are about 20 20 25 dollars each so it does add a little bit of extra cost and the final concern is that this can potentially lead to delays in diagnosing unintended pregnancy uh, because you may think that you know your period hasn't come but you know you wouldn't know because you have you've skipped that hormone free interval but in the end this is what we typically recommend to patients part of being out in practice is that you will actually build up a set of resources that you'll use to counsel patients. And this is one of my favorite resources. This is actually from the Seattle Children's Hospital. And I like it because it reassures people that, you know, if we're using this in children, it's safe for people. And it really just guides people in the use of, com of continuous birth control pills and extended cycling, and it is safe. And it's a really good resource if you're ever bored. I'll link it in the, in the Piazza post from below. So anyways, guys, I hope you learned something about the use of combined hormonal contraceptives. Um, and why compliance is so important and when the worst time to miss your pills are. I'll see you later this week. Take care. Bye.